Good morning. Let's stand together. It's great to be together and worship our God in the beauty of his holiness. Amen. Are you glad to be here? Well, why don't you greet one another? Say hello to the person sitting next to you. And we are going to prepare and sing our worship to God together. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. So let's do that. Let's make a joyful noise today, all right?
so good. Your mercy endures forever. We thank you, our good and gracious King. Our hope is truly found in you, and may we sing of that loud and proud in this place today. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for your love for us. Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone is solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving seen. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand.
Yes, God, we thank you. We thank you for this incredible assurance for the person of Jesus Christ. We love you. We praise you. For us in Jesus' name, amen. Yes, and have a seat. Good morning and welcome to Willingdon Church. My name is Maria and I've been attending Willingdon for just over 11 years now. Um, and I've been serving in a number of different ministries over the years. I recognize some people I've served with over the past 10 years. And this is my good friend, Heather. Heather, how long have you been attending Willingdon and what areas of ministry are you currently serving in? Uh, yeah, I've been attending Willingdon since I was a wee tot here. I've had the pleasure of growing up here and I currently serve with student ministries in senior high. Um, and we're here to introduce you to these four cards that are hopefully already familiar to you, but if not, you can find them in the seat in front of you. And we'll start with the Connect card, the orange one. So this is for anyone who's new to Willingdon, or perhaps you've been coming for a while and you're just struggling to get connected. We'd love for you to fill out the back and um, turn it into the Welcome Center, which is just straight out the doors, kind of to the left. And hopefully someone will contact you and help you get connected. The second prayer we have is, sorry, the second card we have is the prayer card, and it's the TO1. If you have a prayer concern or a praise item, we'd ask that you fill this out and drop it off in the resource center. And there's a team of people who will be praying over these requests throughout the coming week. If you'd like prayer in person, there will also be a group of people up front um, that you can pray with specifically after this service. And next is our offering envelope. Uh, we believe that giving of our finances is a form of worship and a way that we can thank God for all the blessings that he's given us. And so you can put your money or check inside the envelope and then turn it into the resource center or you can give online at willingdon.org. And the last card is our newsletter card. So this is a QR code that you can use um, to scan with this, um, the camera on your smartphone and sign up for a weekly newsletter and get details on what is happening at Willingdon during the week. So that newsletter comes out on Friday. You can stay connected that way. And our most exciting announcement is that in three weeks, the ever-famous Fall Festival is returning to Willingdon. So have a look at the video.
Psalm 63, it says, Oh God, you are my God, and earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because of your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Can we just take a few moments right now in the sanctuary, in the presence of our God, in his power and his glory, in a land actually where there is plenty of water and it is lush, and we seem to have uh, uh, all that we need, but in the midst of the bounty, maybe you are faced this morning just in a season of dryness. The Lord's presence and love is steadfast. Could we stand in this place together? And because his love is better than life, our lips have praised him. But can we take a few moments to lift up our hands in his name if you are able to do that? Lord, we lift up our hands to you, God. A sign of just total surrender and adoration to you. All that we have is what you have given us, God. And it all belongs back to you every part, God. We love you more than anything. And I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Please stay standing with us for the reading of scripture. Today's passage is from Genesis 32, 22 to 32. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. 
Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Amen. Thank you, Heather and Maria, for reading the scriptures. Uh, Yeah, you may be seated. So good to be back with you. If you haven't noticed, I've been gone for a number of weeks and uh, spent some time on my motorcycle riding around the Caribou and the Okanagan, Kootenays, down into Washington State. We live in a beautiful part of the world. And then my children came out from um, Toronto and Montreal with my grandsons. I'm glad they brought my grandsons. That's what matters. No, it was good to be with all of them. But full weeks. Children under two years of age have a lot of energy. And uh, we had a good time together in Seashelt. And just very thankful to be back uh, with you here at Willingdon. Uh, It's been good to watch online and be one of those online viewers. So if you're watching online, welcome here. Uh, It's so good to worship together with Pastor Jerry and the worship team and orchestra last weekend, choir today. Good to hear the Word of God preached through, through different members of our congregation, and just the joy to be with you here today and to look at this passage in Genesis chapter 32. Uh, we'll look at the verses leading up to the passage that was read and then look at some of the things that happened right after Jacob's encounter with God. So let's pray. Father, we are grateful And we thank you that you have left us with your word. And we pray, Jesus, that you would teach us this morning as you taught your first disciples by your spirit. Open up our minds and hearts to your word. May we receive it and then apply it to our lives. Know how to put it into practice in daily life. So we trust you for that grace. And it's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. I'd like to begin with uh, a question. What kind of opportunity would change your life? Do you think that there's a person that could change your life? Who would you need to meet? And then a third question. Would anything need to change in your life to change, would anything need to change in you for your life to change? When I have some free time, I like watching uh, Britain's Got Talent or America's Got Talent. I like watching it because you have these unassuming artists like Susan Boyle getting onto the platform and singing or dancing and performing. And you see the, the jaws of panel members and of the audience just dropping as these people display their God-given talent. I think if I was on America's Got Talent and I started singing, Simon Cowell would put up his hand and say, Ray, I'm not sure that's the right song for you. Or, why did you come on this show anyways? You know, contestants, they they sign up for that show because they believe that TV exposure and the evaluation of Simon Cowell will change their lives. Their true talent will be acknowledged for what it truly is. Their potential will become known, and new opportunities will be granted. And it's not unusual for a member of the panel to say, after a really good audition, This audition today is going to change your life. Your life will never be the same. And the interesting thing to note is that it's not that the contestant needs to change in any way. They just need to be known. Their potential needs to be known. They've already got all that they need for life to change. If they're just known, new opportunities will be afforded to them. So again, those questions, what kind of opportunity would change your life? Who do you need to meet in order for your life to change? And for your life to change, does anything need to change in you? 
As we begin today's episode, Jacob is traveling in the direction of his brother Esau. And he's just full of fear. Why? Because 20 years earlier, he cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright and blessing. And here's how that episode ended. Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So the last time that we saw Esau in the Jacob story, he was just waiting for his father to die so that he could murder his brother. And now 20 years have passed. How many nights did Jacob stay awake, twisting and turning in his bed, thinking about what he had done to Jacob, sorry, to Esau, thinking about how he had cheated his brother, the way that he had deceived his father, the reason for his flight. Now he's going back to the land of Canaan and he has to face his past. Jacob's afraid, reasonably so. He sends messengers ahead to gather some information. How bad is the situation? His messengers go ahead and they find out that Esau is coming, only he's not coming alone. He's coming with 400 men, a militia. It is time for war. Now, Jacob, he's always been resourceful, right? And so he divides his family into two camps, thinking, well, maybe at least one camp will survive. It's a defensive move. And then he goes to prayer. Roman talked about this last weekend. He starts to appeal to God's compassion, to God's faithfulness. God, you asked me to return. You said that you would bless me. You are so compassionate, God. You've promised to do me good. You said that my offspring will be like the sand of the sea. And here maybe we have the first hint of Jacob learning to trust God. Why? Because he's appealing to who God is, God's character. He's appealing to what God has said. And then Jacob, he goes back to his own resourcefulness and he just smothers Esau with gifts. Five herds or flocks, a whole bunch of animals. Look at this. 220 goats, 220 sheep, 30 camels, 50 head of cattle, and 30 donkeys. That's 550 animals plus their young. That's a massive gift. If Esau ever wanted to be a farmer, it's now. Five waves to pacify Esau. Maybe, just maybe, he can win Esau's favor. Jacob, he believes that he, if, if he maximizes this opportunity to meet his brother Esau, then just maybe he can return to the land of Canaan and dwell in peace. So he's using all of his resources to make it work. But the truth is this, and this is what I want us to get right here. The key to life change is not using our resources to maximize the opportunities that are in front of us. Sometimes we're told that lie. That if we just maximize opportunities, we can make life work. We can make it happen for ourselves. True life change is not found in using our resources to maximize an opportunity. It's found somewhere else. Jacob's thinking about facing Esau. But before he faces Esau, he must face someone else. He's actually not ready to meet Esau. He's not ready for the opportunity. Let's go to our text again. Genesis 32, verse 22. The same night he arose and took took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. The river Jabbok, it's a tributary that flows westward into the Jordan River, about 39 kilometers north of the Dead Sea. Verse 23, he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. So out of anxiety, 
out of fear. He sends everything ahead, including wives, wives and children. Sends everything across the river Jabbok at night. Everything going in Esau's direction. And then verse 24. And Jacob was left alone. Jacob's alone. In the night. It's a touching moment. It's a, a poignant moment. There's Jacob, alone. He's vulnerable. He's wrestling. He's anxious. He's agonizing. He's desperate. In the darkness of the night, he needs to meet someone. But who does he need to meet? Perhaps you're at a critical juncture in your life. You're struggling. You feel vulnerable. You feel weak. You're desperate. Who do you need to meet? Do you need to meet the right doctor, the love of your life, the right real estate agent, the right immigration official? Who do you need to meet? Who could change your life? Going back to verse 24, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Jacob's been wrestling with people his whole life, right? Right from his mother's womb, wrestling with his brother, wrestling with his father, wrestling with Uncle Laban, wrestling with his lives, all, wives, always wrestling, 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 a lifetime of wrestling, and now he's in the fight of his life. Who is the man who has come to wrestle with Jacob? It's a mysterious encounter to say the least. Hosea chapter 12 verse 4 says that an angel came to wrestle with him. The Lord sent an angel to wrestle with Jacob. We'll read that passage in a moment. God in his sovereign grace, in his wisdom, in his mercy, has chosen this moment in Jacob's life to come wrestle with him. Why? Because he's all alone. Because finally, he's at the end. His resources depleted. And when the angel appears, Jacob is still ready to fight. It's amazing. <laughs> Verse 25, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Many believe that Jacob was physically strong. When Rachel came to the well, Jacob was able to remove the covering of the well on his own. Usually it would take a few men. But at this moment, beside the river Jabbok, Jacob is already 97 years old. <laughs> the point of this episode is not that Jacob was physically strong, strong enough to wrestle with an angel. Because with a mere touch the angel was able to put his hip out of joint. The joint in the hip being the pivot of strength for a wrestler. With just a touch, Jacob's strength, it shrivels. The point was not the physical strength of, joke, of Jacob. Did you notice that the angel injures Jacob? Why? Would God come to wrestle with us and injure us? We always think of God as our healer, right? He's the one who, who binds us up, who, who brings peace, who makes things work, smooths things out. What if God comes to wrestle with us? Perhaps it's appropriate to cite an often quoted classic of, of C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Aslan, in the story, represents Jesus. Lewis's character, Lucy, asks Mr. Beaver if Aslan is safe. And Mr. Beaver says, if there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than me or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, asked Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. The God who has come to wrestle with Jacob, he isn't safe, 
but he is so good. You see, by putting Jacob's hip out of joint, God desires to work a deeper healing in Jacob's soul. The fight is not about physical strength. It's not even about Jacob's preparation to meet his brother Esau. It's about a deeper work in Jacob's soul. And what needs to happen to Jacob? What is so wrong with Jacob? And what could heal him? Verse 26. Then he, the angel, said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob, he's physically broken. He's weak, but he won't give up. He's clinging on to the man for blessing, pleading for blessing. The prophet Hosea says that he wept. Jacob is weak. He's praying. He's clinging. He's weeping. Maybe he already perceives the man to be a messenger of God. And the angel asks him the key question of the whole episode. Look at verse 27. And he said to him, what is your name? What's your name? This is the peak moment of the whole Jacob story. Who are you, Jacob? What's your name? What's your character? Who are you? You see, in order for Jacob to enter into the promised land and be blessed, he must own something. He must face himself. He must face his life of deception. He can't take all of this ugly baggage into the land of Canaan. He cannot go as he is. He must confess who he is. And Jacob says, Jacob. My name is Jacob. I'm the heel grabber. I'm the one who cheated his brother. I'm the one who deceived his father. I'm the one guilty of wrestling with people my whole life. I'm the guilty. I'm guilty of hustling for blessing. I've spent my whole life out hustling everyone, including you, God. When you made promises to me, I bargained with you. When you said that you would bless me abundantly, I said I'd give you a portion, just a tithe. I've always been bargaining, bargaining with you, God. I have never, never what? What has Jacob never done? What has Jacob never done? You see, Jacob's character flaw, it goes much deeper than the manipulating and the deceiving and the using and the wrestling. These are just symptoms of a much more pervasive, insidious illness deep within his soul. And it's only because God has come to wrestle with him that he's finally going to see it. It's only by God's grace that we see it. You see, Jacob has been spending his whole life making life work on his own. He's got the talent. He's got the resources. He's got the intelligence. He's got the cleverness. He can make it happen. He may even bargain with God now and then, but he doesn't need God. He can do it on his own. And God in his severe mercy is determined. It's God's grace. He, God is determined to overcome this most pervasive, insidious illness deep in his soul. This is the way God sees the human heart. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. You see, God knows Jacob's heart. He knows your heart. He knows my heart. We hide nothing from him. Jacob, he's never going to be a man of faith if he's trying to make life work on his own. Many of us have faith in ourselves. 
We just naturally do. We're self-reliant. We depend on our successes, our achievements, our additions, the things we've done. We believe we're masters of our destiny, and our culture is crazy enough to sell us that lie. Just maximize your opportunities. Use your talent. You can do it. All we need is a Simon Cowell or someone else <laughs> to help others acknowledge who we truly are, all of the potential we have. Jacob, he was always on the hustle, on the hustle for blessing, taking advantage of every opportunity, deceiving his brother, lying to his father, outmaneuvering his uncle, negotiating with God, wrestling, trying to get what he really wanted, but he never found what he really needed. In all of this hustling, in all of this wrestling, in all of this maneuvering, Jacob never found life. It was only when he was alone, beside the river Jabbok, depleted at the end of himself, that he was gifted with the true blessing, the great blessing, God himself. You see, true life change only comes through meeting God and surrendering. True life is found nowhere else. God is the life giver. Jesus is the life. There is life nowhere else. We can spend our lives searching and fighting and wrestling and maneuvering, and we will never find life. Life is found in God alone. Amen. So what does it take to break our self-sufficiency? Well, usually it's a crisis or a tragedy. It takes that moment where life appears to be totally out of control. Everything is coming undone. It seems like everything that we touch goes wrong. I remember sitting at the beach in Brazil, just broken and saying, God, why it appears that you're against me? God, in his severe mercy, was breaking me, putting me in a place that I never wanted to be. God, in his grace, orchestrates these these struggles. Why? Because he loves us. He wants us to acknowledge who he truly is and who we are. He wants to heal us. He actually cares about our healing much more than us getting what we want. Sometimes we're just content with all the blessings that we might receive and being a part of what God's doing in the world, being a part of the church family, and we're not really interested in God himself. We're self-reliant, we're self-directed, we're self-confident, we're self-righteous, all of that ugly stuff. So much self, I get so tired of myself. <laughs> so much self. And that self-reliant nature, it runs so deep in our souls that we actually need God to take back the blinders and help us see what's inside, our independence, what keeps us from him. It's only by God's grace that we see it. Jacob, he has to face his self-sufficiency in order to meet God and be truly blessed. J.I. Packer, in his classic book, Knowing God, he describes Jacob in this way. He had hitherto been self-reliant, believing himself to be more than a match for anything that might come. But now he felt his complete inability to handle things and knew with blinding, blazing certainty that never again dare he trust himself to look after himself and to carve out his destiny. Never again dare he try to live by his wits. See, God loves us so much that he does not want to leave us enslaved to our own wits, our own cleverness, our own intelligence. It's his mercy. A transformation is happening here in Jacob's heart. Verse 28, then he, the angel, said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but 
Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. You see, that name change, it signifies a character change. Something's changing in Jacob. God's doing a deep work in him. Jacob is rebaptized as Israel. As Jacob surrenders, as he concedes, he's being transformed. Jacob, he goes from deceiver of people to someone who prevails with God. His new name, it represents a reorientation in his life. Jacob's not going to prevail with his own wits now. No, no, he's going to prevail by praying in weakness. He's not going to prevail by conniving through his own human strength. He's going to move forward in God's strength. This is the change from Jacob to Israel. The prophet Hosea writes this about this encounter. Hosea 12, in the womb, he, Jacob, took his brother by the heel, and in his manhood, he strove with God. He strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He met God at Bethel. Jacob met God and it changed him. In his spiritual maturing, maturing, he strove with God. He clung to God. He prayed desperately. He cried out for blessing. He met God. He was out hustled by God. He lost, but he won. And that's the paradox. When we lose, we think we're losing, we actually win. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Screwtape Letters, writes about this paradox. When God talks of their losing themselves, people losing themselves, he means only abandoning the clamor of self-will. Once they have done that, he really gives them back all their personality and boasts that when they are wholly his, they will be more themselves than ever. When it appears that we have lost, we win. God comes to wrestle with us so that we will finally surrender, give in, and become the people that he has actually created us to be. Jacob's identity, it went from struggling with people to struggling with God. What name would God give you or me today? Am I Ray, the person who struggles with people, or Ray, the person who struggles with God? Who are we struggling with? Are we struggling with family members, colleagues, fellow students, government officials, neighbors? Who are we struggling with? Do we struggle with people or do we struggle with God? When God comes to wrestle with us, it is his severe mercy, his divine grace. And he does that so that we will take the opportunity to take hold of him, cling to him, become attached to him, be intimate with him, because that is where the life is found. Amen. And God loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us running after other things or other people looking for life. Amen. We can cling to him, surrender to him, Or we can walk away in our independence and keep fighting. Do you want to keep fighting or do we want to surrender? You see, surrendering to God gives us with a changed heart. A changed heart. God answers Jacob's life of wrestling with this gracious encounter. Jacob probably thought, even God is against me. (laughs) God was actually for him. It was all God's grace. Verse 29. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. The angel's question is another way of asking, Jacob, don't you realize who I am? This encounter, it's been terrifying, but it's been intimate. Verse 30. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Face to face, that's a a figure of speech for intimacy with God. The phrase, it implies this close personal encounter with God. Verse 31, the sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. What a beautiful picture. 
the sun is rising, and, and, and Jacob, he's now limping forward. After years of living under the oppression of his uncle, Label, uncle Laban, years of living under the darkness and the guilt of his own soul, he now hobbles forward as a new man. The sun is rising. The sun has set on the Jacob who goes his own way, and the sun is rising on the new Jacob, now Israel. Whatever desire Jacob had for blessing, God purified it at Peniel. So he walks forward, limping, but he's transformed. It's a new day. All those who walk with God will learn to limp. In the trials and the perplexities of life, God, in his grace, in his mercy, will form us. And sometimes it will appear that God is actually against us, but he's for us because he wants to do that deeper work in our souls. He wants us to be one with him. He wants us to find where the true life is. Amen. How do we know that Jacob's changed? Where's the evidence? Genesis 33, verse 10. Jacob is going to meet Esau. And the after meeting with God, Jacob now says this. No, please. If I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. Jacob saying, I have enough. I'm ready to bless you, Esau. Thus he urged him, and he took it. After facing God, Jacob was ready to face Esau. Once Jacob's heart issues had been resolved, he was able to walk toward the land of Canaan and face his brother. Esau accepts the gift. It's proof of reconciliation. Jacob blesses Esau. Later, he'll bless his sons. He'll become a blessing to the nations. God's grace from beginning to end. All of that didn't happen because of Jacob's potential, because of his talent, because of his resources, because of his ability to wrestle with everyone. That was God's grace. What does the story mean for us? I have a word for those of you who maybe have never actually taken that step of surrendering your lives to God. And then a word for those of us who have maybe taken that step of surrender, but today we're in a difficult spot, and it's hard to stay in that place of surrender. First of all, for those of you that have never surrendered your life to God, and you're in a really difficult space today, and you're wondering what it's all about, I would suggest this. If you're in a real place of struggle today, it probably is God pursuing you. God has orchestrated the circumstances of your life so that you will meet him. He's trying to get your attention. Suffering is God's megaphone. And what you most need in this moment is not a new relationship or a new opportunity or a financial blessing or a PR card or physical healing. What you most need is God himself. Because he's the giver of life. What you most need is a genuine relationship with him. Not just an encounter, not just an experience, not just a feeling. You need to surrender to him. Surrender who you are. Surrender all that you are. And cling to God for his mercy. Amen. Because God in his grace and mercy has come to meet you. God has lovingly set his gaze on you. Like a mother looking at a beloved child. That's the way God loves us. 
And he loves us so much that he draws us to himself so that we might find life. Jesus said this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. It's an act of surrender. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. It's as we surrender. In that moment when we think we're losing, that we actually win. (laughs) You see, our healing, it comes through oneness with God. It comes through being attached to him. That's where the healing is. God knows everything about you. He knows you completely. He knows you fully. He knows exactly how you've been formed. He knows everything that you've done. And yet he has his gaze on you and he is drawing you to himself. And so if you're in that place today and you sense the Holy Spirit speaking to you, I'm going to pray with you just in a minute to guide you through a prayer of surrender. Don't miss this moment. Our attachment to God heals us. It heals us. So we can surrender or keep on fighting. Now, here's a word for those of us who have surrendered in the past, but today we're we're really wondering where God is. We're wondering whether God still loves us. We're wondering whether God actually has his hand on our journey. We don't understand what's happening in our lives. Doesn't make sense to us. Know that God loves you. There is no truth more foundational than that. That God is love and he knows you and he loves you and has his hand on you. And if God has come to wrestle with you in the midst of your trial, in the midst of this crisis, it's because he wants to heal you. And your healing is found in clinging to him, being attached to him. It's true that we're forgiven as we accept what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus gave his life and paid the price for our sin, took all of our sin upon himself so that we might be forgiven. We have been justified. We have been made right with God. But that is unto something. There's more. God wants us to walk one with him, clinging to him, attached to him throughout life, knowing that the life is truly found in him. And our hearts so easily stray, we begin to think, well, maybe my life is over here as well, or it's in that person, or it's in that opportunity. No, life is found in God and God alone. And if we're straying, God loves us so much that he's going to draw us back. He will pursue us. And if we need to be broken, he will break us because of his love for us. So where are we today? If you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus, I would encourage you to do that today. Listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Say yes to Jesus. Life is found in him. And if we've been following for a while and we're straying a bit and need to re-surrender and attach ourselves to God again, let's do that. Life is found in God alone. Let's pray. I ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to pray a prayer, and you can follow me in that. Jesus, thank you for pursuing me. Thank you for your love for me. Please forgive me for trying to make life work without you. Forgive me for living as if you don't exist. I now turn to you. Jesus, I'm surrendering to you. 
I thank you for dying for me on the cross and paying the price for all my sin. I didn't deserve that, but you did that in your great mercy. I turn to you for forgiveness, for new life. I surrender my whole life to you. Jesus, I I want to live attached to you now. Fill me with your spirit. Heal me. Make me the person you created me to be. Jesus, I'm yours. And I thank you for gifting me with life now and forever. It's in your name that I pray, Jesus. Amen. And if you've prayed a prayer of surrender today or re-surrender, please uh, tell someone that you came with or you can come forward for prayer after the service. You can go to the prayer center. Share that with someone that walks closely with you. We're going to go into a time of worship. And then we'll close. Also, we're going to leave some questions for your reflection as we prepare to sing. sing the song together and it is very much a prayer that you can pray to God and as you think about maybe what it is that you are wrestling with or what you're struggling to release and give into the hands of Jesus um, remember that he is with you through that and he wants you to experience full healing and restoration in the Father's presence so if you want to stay seated you can You can stand if you'd like. You can kneel, whatever posture you would like to be in as we pray and worship.
And I will search for yours Jesus, take my life And lead me on And Lord, you have my heart And I will search for yours Let me be to you a sacrifice I will praise and I will praise you Lord I will sing of love come down and as you show We'll see your glory here. Sing, I will praise and I will praise you, Lord. I will sing of love come down and I Amen. Thank you, CJ, Silas. May we live surrendered to Jesus. Amen. That's where life is. It's in Him. In comparison to that, this seems unimportant, but it's going to be fun. Fall Festival, September 11th. If you'd like to invite a, a family member or a friend, you can get these invitations in the Resource Center, Sunday, September the 11th. There's going to be a, a, a hot dog stand, Ray's International Hot Dog Stand. It's going to be fun. They're free. Please come. Invite your friends and family. And have a wonderful week. If you need prayer, you can come forward. You can go to the prayer center. Just a word of blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.